Here, what we're looking at here is, it's actually a lobster crayfish. I'm not actually sure what that's supposed to be. Certainly not a human, but the process is actually the same in humans. And this is essentially how we're going to generate what we call a generator potential or a receptor potential. They mean the same thing. And those generator potentials slash receptor potentials are actually graded potentials. And you'll remember that I talked about sensory nervous, uh, the sensory physiology having its own vocabulary. So yes, they are graded potentials, period. That's what they are. But we call them the generator or the re receptor potential. And based on these graded potentials, I want you to remember that graded potentials can be um, hyper or hypopolarizing. In the case of a receptor potential, they're um, depolarizing, right? And so they can be a weak depolarizing stimuli, or a bit, little bit bigger, or a little bit bigger, or really, really big, okay? And that's essentially what we're looking at with these graded potentials as they change in size. Let's go back to this crayfish slash lobster dude and look at it. And you can see that based on the stimuli, if we're dealing with these little antenna guys here, okay, if they bend slightly, all right, it's a weak stimuli, and that actually generates a weak excitatory postsynaptic potential up here. Po excitatory, oh, I forgot a P. We'll squeeze the little P right here. Excitatory postsynaptic potential there. And um, what that does, so now remember over here when we're dealing with neurons. Um, your typical standard neuron. I'll even flip back here and we'll see if we can pull this up really quickly. Ignore the train tracks. I'll explain that. Probably not actually. But anyway, here's my typical neuron. You'll remember that in the typical neuron, a little tiny graded potential is unlikely to generate an action potential because it's probably going to be sub-threshold by the time it gets to the axon hillock. But now go down here, a small graded potential can in fact generate an action potential. And what ends up happening is that the size of the action potential, or sorry, the action potential is always exactly the same size. Always exactly the same size, always exactly the same duration. But the size of the graded potential determines how frequently action potentials are generated. If we have a weak graded potential, will generate a relatively low frequency of action potentials as shown here. But if our graded potential here, our excitatory postsynaptic potential here is larger, then we actually generate a rapid frequency. And by frequency, I mean events per minute or events per second. And so this would essentially be action potentials per second. And we could see here, you know, if we were measuring action potentials here, we have three action potentials per seven seconds. And down here, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So eight action potentials per seven seconds, right, on average. And so that's essentially the, the thing here is that we're going to be changing the frequency of these um, action potentials. So why does that matter? Well, it ends up that our brain uses that frequency of action potentials. Remember, everything is arriving and it's all just action potentials. But our brain needs to integrate this information and process this information and use this information to determine the importance of the stimuli it's being received. And so the brain uses the frequency of action potentials to decode or to stimulate, let's, sorry, to integrate, to determine intensity. Go back here. Notice this is weak. So we have a low intensity stimulation. Still action potentials. These are the same as, same size, right? Same size, but the frequency is different. Whereas so down here, this would be a higher intensity. And so based on that frequency of action potentials, the brain says, ha ha, this is a big, big deal. Or eh, this is just a light, tiny little thing. So I, you know, and it, prov it provides information about how strong the signal is to the brain. Higher frequencies of action potentials, 
go back here. What this is going to do, here's my little brain dude. Um, our brains don't look like that. At least mine doesn't, I hope. But um, incidentally, this one, if we were to look at the actual synapse for the weak stimuli, we'd get some neurotransmitter released. But if we were to, so weak, look at the synapse, and so we'd have another neuron over here, of course, with receptors. Synapse for the strong signal, the high intensity. Remember, each one of those action potentials is releasing neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. And so we're going to get more neurotransmitter in the synaptic cleft. And we're going to get a much more robust signal because we're activating more receptors on that postsynaptic neuron. Okay, so don't forget that. Don't forget to, you know, know you're supposed to learn about synapses in the neurons and synapse lecture. And now you need to understand how to apply that knowledge here. Okay, so learning about intensity, that's a really big thing, and that's actually done through the frequency of action potentials. Duration is also going to be coded based on the information found in the action potentials, but its coding is a little bit different. We actually have two types of neurons. One is called a, or sensory receptors, two types. They can be phasic, tonic, or phasic tonic or phasic. Tonic means that the signal tends to last longer. Phasic, it doesn't. Phasic receptors adapt. Okay, Phasic receptors adapt to the stimuli, which means they respond when the stimuli is initially detected. And then after that, their response decreases and sometimes completely disappears. You have a lot of tactile receptors that are, are in fact phasic. Thermal receptors also that are phasic. And if you think about that, so you're going to think about the real world and what you experience. When you put your, well, when you put clothes on, for example, how many of you, before I said clothes, right, how many of you actually noticed the feel of your clothes against your skin? And the chances are you probably didn't. Now that I said something, you probably, oh, yeah, I can kind of feel that because your brain turns some more attention to it. But prior to calling it out, you didn't notice it. When you very first put those clothes on, though, your brain was aware and felt them. It, it perceived that, hey, I've got clothes on. I'm not naked right now. And that's because the phasic receptors informed your brain of it. But then after that, there's no point in continuing to inform the brain because that information kind of becomes irrelevant or something that we shouldn't focus on. Whereas tonic receptors are constantly receiving inform or sending information. We're going to look at tonic receptors first and, and see what we've got here. And here we've got this diagram where we now actually are just going to substitute little spikes for our action potentials, but assume that those are... Um, full-size action potentials there are, you know, they look like action potentials do, right? Rising phase, falling phase, hyperpolarization phase, but they're really squished. The timeline is, is uh, different, and so we just have these little spikes. In this example, the stimulus is applied at this arrow here, and the stimulus is withdrawn at this arrow here. And you're going to notice that for the entire duration of the stimuli, from the moment that it was first applied to the moment that it's renewed, we are receiving action potentials at a certain frequency. And that frequency continues, and what that essentially informs my brain, the brain is constantly perceiving this information at all times. It is very much aware okay, that there's a stimuli there. Now, not necessarily consciously aware. This information could be going to the hy uh, hippo, uh, hypothalamus, for example, or it could be going to the pons or the medulla oblongata, which is actually in the pons. Or it could be going to any of the centers in the midbrain that do not reach um, conscious level. But regardless, that's still part of the brain, and that's still recognizing here's this stimuli. 
Types of stimuli that fit into this category include things like blood pressure, blood osmolarity, blood oxygen levels, blood carbon dioxide levels, um, and so on. Okay, these are the types of stimuli that fit into these tonic receptors and have this particular pattern where they are going to continue to stimulate. The intensity is still being coded by the frequency. So if we have a higher intensity signal, for example, okay, what we would end up seeing is, is more frequent action potentials. So we'll throw in some action potentials in the middle so you can see now we've got suddenly a, a higher frequency. And that tells my brain this is a bigger stimulus. This is more intense. This is this is wow. And so imagine if this were blood pressure, for example. We might get a signal saying, all right, blood pressure is normal, and it would look like that. But then maybe your blood pressure will elevate, and your receptors now are going to generate a much higher frequency action potential, telling my brain, my blood pressure just went up. What happened? My blood pressure just went up. Okay. And so, you know, we get this information being communicated to the brain, even if we don't necessarily consciously perceive it. This is another way of looking at it. This is, again, a tonic receptor where we can actually see the coding for intensity and duration. So let me first draw your attention to the stimuli portion down here. And so what we've got with these little blocks here is simply... Um, simply what represents the, the, dur the stimuli, okay? So the type of stimuli didn't matter. We can go ahead and assume it's blood pressure maybe, okay? So maybe this is going to be how much our arteries are stretching out. We have mechanical receptors, those barrel receptors that we talked about in our aorta, and they're going to stretch based on how much blood is present in the aorta on average. And so maybe, you know, first stimuli, maybe we <laughs> we'd be in trouble if this were blood pressure for the record. But uh, maybe our blood pressure is so low, woo, we're not conscious, okay. But anyway, it's so low that um, it is below threshold. And so, yes, we get a little tiny generator potential, but we don't actually reach the threshold necessary to trigger the action potential. So this would be below that minus 55 millivolts, right? And so it would certainly be sub-threshold. And notice that I don't have any action potentials here. You're in big trouble if this is actually blood pressure. But now let's take a look at this. Let's go ahead and pretend that this segment here is blood pressure. I really should pick something else. But anyway, this is blood pressure now. And so you can see, you know, blood pressure is higher. It's a bigger stimuli. There's, there's more pressure there. And if we look at that, it's going to generate a stronger generator potential. And now we're supra-threshold. So this would be sub-threshold. And this would be supra-threshold. Okay. And so at that point, we're going to get the generation of these action potentials right here. Okay. And so the brain is going to receive that information and be like, okay, my blood pressure's in the normal range or what have you. Um, and then maybe you almost get in a car accident and you're like super stressed for a moment. And so during that time period, your blood pressure perhaps, here's the size of the stimuli, big, oh my gosh, you know, your blood pressure just skyrocketed. Okay, and it's going to stay elevated for this amount of time. So you can see that this is my duration. And so, you know, again, um, that's going to change my frequency. And so based on this intensity, my brain's like, oh, <laughs> I'm almost dead. Uh-oh. Compensate, compensate, compensate. Homeostasis has been lost. Mayday, we're in trouble. So uh, this is average. This is normal we're pretending and this is high and so my brain can perceive these and interpret these and then we can actually see the duration here and so you'll notice that these last for the same duration if we were to follow this up it's approximately the same duration I guess I didn't draw that very well but the brain would learn about how long the blood pressure is at average versus how long the blood pressure is 
higher than average. And so based on that, we would also code for the duration. Now, your phasic receptors di are different. So notice here that we, again, we're going to start down here. Here's my stimulus applied. And you're going to see that that stimuli right here initiates some action potentials. And at first, depending on how big that, how strong that stimulus is, they might be fairly frequent. But then I want you to notice this one. Let's look at this. Stimulus withdrawn. Okay. Notice that after the first initial burst, we're going to call this a burst. So after this first initial burst right here, things slowed down a lot. My frequency changed. And in this example, my frequency changed so that um, they're farther apart. But it's also possible and even common for the phasic receptors to simply just stop. And then they might get a little tiny bit of bursting information when the stimulus withdraw, but they could very well look like that, for example. And yet my d the stimulus, <laughs> we're getting stimulated the whole time. The stimuli is still present the whole time. Um, but the information is lost. And as I mentioned, touch receptors often do this. If you think about, and thermal receptors do, think about climbing into a hot bath. If we were to put a thermometer in that bath, or even a hot tub, okay, so baths lose their temperature, you know, they lose heat to the atmosphere. But a hot tub has a heater, and so it's going to continually regenerate the heat. So the hot tub maybe would be programmed to stay at 104 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And it might fluctuate between 104 and 102, but it's going to stay in that range. And so, you know, you can climb in that hot tub, and when you first put your foot in it, you're like, ah, this stings a bit. But then you climb in, and you, t you relax a little bit, and within just a few minutes, your thermal receptors have stopped firing action potentials, and we call that adaptation. And so your thermal receptors, you're still aware that the, the, they don't all deactivate. You're still aware that the hot tub is hot, but it no longer stings. It no longer um, feels like it's hot. It still does a great job relaxing your muscles, but it's not as uncomfortable for you. And so that's an example of a phasic receptor and how it adapts. By the way, your thermal receptors will not adapt in high ranges. So if you are in a range where the heat is going to damage your skin, you will feel that heat. It'll also end up activating nociception because as your tissue is damaged, you're going to begin to feel pain. And likewise, cold is kind of the same thing. If we're in a range of cold that is far too dangerous for us, we don't adapt to that cold. But otherwise you do. You can put your hand in uh, you know, well, you've probably done this with a swimming pool, right? You jump in the swimming pool and it's a little cold when you first jump in. But then after swimming in it for a little while, we're assuming a non-heated swimming pool, you get used to the temperature and your cold receptors adapt. Or They're all thermal receptors, but the cold sensing thermal receptors adapt. And again, if we take a look here then at our um, tonic versus phasic, and I kind of, I apologize, the, the figure's kind of a little funky, because really all I did was take this, this figure here and kind of modify it a bit with my white marker thingy. But nevertheless, this still gives us the basic idea where, again, you know, phasic receptors, let's say it's a thermal receptor, and it's a little warm, but it's not warm enough to trip that switch. We're not getting activation. We don't get action potentials. So our brain doesn't perceive heat. Okay, and then we reach into this level here where our, the intensity of the heat is higher. Okay, but notice the du duration is the same for all of these, by the way. Duration is exactly the same for all of these, and the same is true with the previous figure. Um, so now we've got a supra threshold generated potential, and we have action potentials here. Okay, and so that's important there. And then here we've got a, the duration and the intensity. So duration here, intensity here. And based on that intensity, we're going to get a bigger 
generator potential, which is also supra threshold, and we're going to get our action potentials. And in this case, I drew a rapid burst at the very beginning, and it's slowing down, um, similar to what we saw previously. Now, just like with the tonic receptors, if the stimuli is strongest, I do want you to notice this, pay attention to this. Notice that right here, the frequency of action potentials is lower than right here. And the reason for that change is the intensity here. This is more intense, this is less intense. And so, you know, we still are seeing a change in frequency. The difference is, does it continually exist or does it adapt? So we would call these slow adapting and these would then be fast adapting. And then in terms of uh, function, you know, generalizing for these things, generalizing, tonic receptors tend to monitor variables that are necessary for homeostasis. So I listed some of those, blood pressure, um, blood oxygen levels, blood carbon dioxide levels, blood glucose levels, blood, um, blood calcium levels, blood osmolarity, um, etc. These tend to be tonic because the goal is to maintain homeostasis or to avoid injury so that we can compensate or repair and restore homeostasis. They are slow to adapt. Phasic receptors tend to send information about environmental, whether it's internal or external environmental conditions that um, really are more like, you know, FYI. They do help change our behavior. They help us regulate. Um, and sometimes they actually trigger reflex pathways. And we're going to get into reflexes and what those are. And so they're certainly important. It's not a difference of one is more important than the other. It's just they have different jobs. Now, uh, to help you understand that it's not always black and white, that it, it's not always super clear, I'm going to show you this example here. <coughs> And we talked about the different receptors in the skin, tactile receptors. Um, I'm not super concerned that you know the names of those so much. It's not probably not going to test on those. But I want you to look at these, these situations. And I want you to notice that the duration of the stimuli is the same for each of these down here. Right? So we've got exactly the same duration no matter which receptor is responding to that. And at least most of these have the same intensity with the exception of this one. This one has much higher intensity here, okay? And so if we take a look at this um, and look at the way these respond, what I really want you to pay attention to is these here. So right here is a good example of a phasic receptor. In this particular example, we get a burst of action potentials at the very beginning and then we get a burst of action potentials at the very end of the stimuli. But in between, we don't have anything. It's adapted. And so the beginning tells us that the stimuli has started. The uh, burst at the end tells us it stopped. And that's really all the brain needs to know. And so if you think about your clothes brushing against your skin, right there is a perfect example of what's going on. You've had action potentials in the beginning. You had action potentials in the end. They're not there now. Um. And then the same thing here, you know, some dynamic deformation of the skin, also phasic, vibration is phasic. But now here we're going to start to increase the depth. Okay, so we're going to, you know, put your finger on your skin and kind of push in. You'll notice your skin kind of indents a little bit. And so we're going to do that. And at this point, it's still phasic. Notice we still have this rapid burst here. But notice also that the intensity has changed. This is more intense. And because of the greater intensity of the signal, um, we do continue to get stimuli afterwards. But notice this segment right here. No action potentials. So even though the intensity is there and it takes longer for it to adapt, it does still in fact adapt. So this would be in fact phasic. And over here, we've got kind of the same thing. We've got a very high intensity right there. We're, if we're pinching the skin or stretching the skin, as long as we're pinching it, we are generating action potentials, although they slow down. There is some adaptation there. 
and uh, you'll notice that they do continue until the end of the stimuli right here okay so um, that one's a little bit in a gray area you could put perhaps say it's got some phasic properties but as the uh, strength of the stimuli increases the the pressure there and so forth the longer the signal lasts this one is phasic you can see that you know you're gonna hold somebody's hand you can feel them but then especially if you notice right here you know eventually that kind of disappears and goes away and so you know you can walk hand in hand with somebody without um, that constantly becoming a, a distraction for you as you focus on what you're talking about or what have you but now this one as the intensity increases okay um, as the risk of injurious force is present going back up here notice that this is also to avoid injury right here okay so that's essentially what you're seeing there you can see that this is definitely tonic even though there's there's a fast burst right here okay but um, despite that that essentially says we're starting this stimuli and that's very common to see with tonic receptors is this very fast burst at the beginning but it lasts the whole time there's not a lot of slowdown and you, even if there's a little tiny bit of slowdown and so this one is the best example of tonic on here okay and so I wanted you to see those because you know we're drawing them up here it's pretty black and white but down here I want you to see that sometimes it's a little harder if I I were to have you identify these I would need to be careful I would need to have you identify this one versus this one for example because if I picked this one that one might be a little gray you know is that phasic is that tonic um, it might be hard for somebody to say with any kind of clarity so know what you're looking for and understand those concepts as 